welcome Carolyn Sparks. Carolyn, it's so good to see you. Thank you. Uh, you you can hear me, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs> I had this terrible moment moment of panic when I couldn't get in and I had tested it this afternoon to make sure everything was fine and it was and then it, it wouldn't recognize my password it was, it was I had to, and then it said I didn't have zoom I had to download it again I mean it's just it was oh it was terrible the joys of technology right I mean it's supposed to make it all easier but we keep hitting up against these various bumps right yeah <laughs> But well, I'm here. appreciating it because I haven't actually seen you, prop I mean, definitely since before the pandemic, because I know we've been at different in-person events over the years. So I'm thrilled even to see you via Zoom. So thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's good to see everybody. I enjoyed the name game. I think it was Madison who was reading some of my books. I, I thank you. Uh, thank you, Madison, for that. And one of them gave me a really stunned me <laughs> one of them on, on the uh, uh the superpower she wants where she can take other people's superpower because that's my next villain <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> how did she know that but yeah I thought the, that would make a really good I thought that she's a villain but I thought for a oh, villain, she is, she is. <laughs> I thought that would be really really good for a villain um uh, kind of like a Highlander type thing, you know, and the, those Highlander, if you, if you chopped off the guys, the other Highlanders or, or Immortals head, you got his power, kind of a thing like that, that if he if a, an embraced person who finds out that if he kills someone, he gets their powers. And so obviously becomes a serial killer and very powerful and it, it would be very hard for them to defeat. We will have to keep an eye out for that then. Definitely. Yeah, that's in the future. <laughs> Well, for some of our readers that aren't familiar with your work, can you tell us how you first started getting into writing? Oh, well, let me turn up the volume. I was kind of a latecomer, mainly because I'm, I'm so good at procrastination, and I'm also really good at self-doubt. And so I was I didn't even start writing till I was in my 40s, because I just didn't think I could do it. I... Like everybody here, I, I always enjoyed reading. I always had my nose in a book. I loved reading. I loved authors. I thought they were amazing, but I didn't think it was something that I could do. And I thought they were all magical. And I was just this, you know, kid from Texas. What did I know? So um, I didn't start till I was in my 40s. I had grown up mostly reading historical romance. So that's what I started off writing. But of course, you know, as old as I am, most things were historical romance. So paranormal, there wasn't a whole lot of paranormal romance back then. Uh, and so I started off historical romance and I was really ignorant about the whole publishing business. And I just picked a time period. I thought, I like the American Revolution. So I'll write a book and set in the American Revolution without knowing that most publishers want a British set historical Regency Victorian or whatever. And, uh, and that I was going to have a really hard sell um, but that book did sell uh, mostly thanks to the Patriot movie that had just come out and um, so that was my first published book and it, so it took two years from the time I started writing to get published or to sell a book um, that book was with Forge which is part of uh, Macmillan mm -hmm. and um, I had a young, very young editor right out of college. Before my book was even on the shelf, she quit her job. Oh. And they let me know that they didn't want anything else from me. And so uh, it, I thought my career was over before, before my first book ever even hit the shelf. It was a very bittersweet debut. debut. I mean, I thought, well, you know, I, I, my dream had come true, but I thought my career was also over at the same time. So I had to basically start over. My agent let me go. Everything kind of fell through. Um, I tried writing a sequel to the book that is sold, but no one, no other publisher wanted a sequel and didn't, especially didn't want one in a time period they didn't like. Um, so I, that was when I actually, I, 
I was trying to figure out what to do, how to start over. Um, and I had an epiphany when I realized that my favorite historical romances were actually paranormal, like the Jude Devereaux time travel type books. One of my favorites, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love those. And I realized I actually love paranormal more than the historical. But I, I mean, I love the historical too. And I, I was thinking, how can I do both? And that's when I landed on vampires because to me, that's an historical hero. If he's 500 years old or whatever, he's a historical hero. And you also, then you have the fun of pairing him up with a modern day heroine who can give him hell and, you know, what he deserves. <laughs> and so I had, I thought, well, this can really be fun. And of course my, I was never into vampires in the scary sense of vampires. All, my favorite vampires were always the comedies or the dark shadows, you know, the, 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 soap opera pot, or, you know that that's so corny that it's funny um or the um the mel brooks type vampire leslie nielsen uh you know george hamilton uh, these these were my favorite vampires were the were the funny ones and it is kind of funny really because it doesn't make any sense and uh you know undead doesn't really make much sense so i thought well i can have fun with this and i did have fun and that's the the love it's Harper Collins. They asked me to start a new series, and I I wrote a proposal for the fantasy romance, the Embrace series, and they didn't said they didn't know what to do with it and how to market it, and they weren't sure, and uh, and you know they so they said, can you do something else? And I said, well, what do you want? And they said, well, we don't know. I'm like, well, I like this series. <laughs> so I'm going to give it a shot. And so my agent shopped it around and St. Martin's picked it up. Uh, they picked up the first, they, they, it was a three book contract. So here's the first one, uh, How to Tame a Beast in Seven Days. The second one was So I Married a Sorcerer. And the third one, eight simple rules for dating a dragon. And that's the, that was the beginning of the Embraced series. And you can see the St. Martin's Press. Uh, they did mass market paperback. Mm -hmm. They tried to, um, because most of my readers were from the Love at Stake series, so they tried to give it sort of a paranormal look uh, to draw them in, all those readers in. Um, and so it, it has a paranormal romance look. But after those three books, uh, St. Martin's Press goes, well, why don't we go back to doing vampires? You know, the vampires never die. And, uh, but the, with the Embrace series, I had originally planned for five books because there were five sisters. And I thought, I don't want to leave the last two sisters undone and leave my readers hanging. And, you know, we got to kill off the bad guys. You need some closure. And uh, so we shopped around and luckily Kensington was more than happy to pick up the series in mid-series, which is kind of unusual. I was kind of thinking I was going to have to self-publish, but uh, Kensington picked it up and, but they went with a very different look, mm -hmm. uh, trade paperback and very much they, they, uh, went full fantasy really on the uh, on the covers. They're beautiful covers. But uh, How to Love Your Elf was the fourth book, and then The Siren in the Deep Blue Sea, the fifth book. People get confused sometimes because uh, Kensington wasn't able to call it the Embrace series because that was uh, copyrighted with St. Martin's Press, so they went with Embrace by Magic, and they call this books one and two which uh, if you're reading all the Embrace books, they're four and five, but for, to the new publisher, it's one and two to them. And uh, and then recently this last book that, because I thought I was done with the Embrace series with the, with the, you know, the fifth sister, I killed the villains. I thought, you know, adios to that world. And then Kensington said, please do some more. And I thought, well, I'm out of sisters. So we went to the next generation. And this is the next generation, 
When a Princess Proposes. This is the one that just recently came out. Um, it's 20 years, 20 year jump. And uh, with the five sisters, they have more than enough children to keep me busy for a while. And uh, so I will probably focus more on the girls, you know, <laughs> than the guys that, you know, their, their sons. I'll focus more on the daughters. Uh, well, considering the Love at Stakes had 16 books, and if they're anxious to see more of the Embraced, that oh, I don't. I I really don't see it going that long. No, <laughs> no, gosh, because you know I actually wrote a proposal after after the fifth book because I thought the series was done. I wrote another proposal for another series, and uh, that I really like. So I still have that in the back of my mind. I have more things I want to do, but uh, I I do really enjoy this world, the embraced world. Um, I think it makes like it's switching publishers kind of midstream. Yeah, yeah. There's three three books with uh, St. Martin's, and now this third one with uh, Kensington. But Kensington really loves this series, and they want to they want to keep it going. Did you find that they were asking for for differences in your style, or was I mean, or was it all very seamless from your perspective? No, it's no. Like now you're working with a they different were, group. They've been so accommodating about it all. I mean, it was like whatever whatever I send in they're they're happy with and I I really didn't make any changes in the world at all so um you know it really is the same series it just has two different looks because of the two different publishers but uh very much the same series and um some people you know some readers think the love at stake and the embrace that the series are just too different for them. And, uh, but to me, I, I just can't see it that way because to me, it's my same voice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still me. It's still my same sense of humor. Uh, you know, I, to me, they're very, there's a lot of similarities where the vampires and shifters were sort of outcasts. And this one, you have your embrace people with their supernatural powers, and they're also kind of outcasts. And they, uh, like the five sisters, they're all, they're all, all um, they're not actually sisters. They're not related, but they make a family together. And uh, that was the same way with the vampires. They, you know, it was an adopted family. And, um, these same themes run through really all of my books uh, of uh, friendship and love and honor and uh, you know uh, to me there there there's a lot there's a lot still a lot similar of similarities between both uh, both series. I'm enjoying the uh, more historical setting because I guess I've always liked that. I've always uh, liked castles and I prefer sword fights, I think, to machine guns. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I like the world and um, I'm not a very, I'm not a techno savvy person at all. So I'm, you know, I'm at home with the, you know, let's ride a horse here and, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have to worry about how does the spaceship power or whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it works for me. <laughs> Do you think that's the additional element of freedom that you have in writing the paranormal and the fantasy? is because there are these elements that you can just, I mean, obviously it's all made up, but but you have a little bit more freedom as to, well, if this is it's not exactly how something is technically, that's okay, because it's my world. And so I can then establish however, whatever rules I want. Well, it is fun to, yeah, to ha just make up your own world. I love the world building. I think that's really why I wanted to get more into fantasy. Because that's why when I was writing the vampire books, there wasn't, there was a certain amount of world building, but it was still our world here. And so um, I was somewhat limited to the world building, but the world building that I did do to explain vampires or the different shifters, where do the were bears come from or the were tigers or whatever, uh, I really discovered I love that. I love the world building. And so to do the embrace, it was like, well, I want to create a whole different world. And that, you know, that was a lot of fun for me. 
Um, and the whole premise for this is that uh, it's a different world. Uh, it has two moons. Then the two moons eclipse each other twice a year. And on that night, any child that is born will have some sort of magical power. And that's, that's really just the basic premise. So that's why there are there is a small minority of people who have supernatural powers. Um, and I wanted them all to have different powers because uh, with the vampires and the shifters, they all kind of had the same basic skill set, which was fun. I mean, they could all teleport. They could all, you know, did this. But after a while, you know, 16 books, two novellas, it got a little bit tiresome, you know, because it was always the same skill set. And, um, you know, you you. I established that those were the rules and then I was stuck with them. And um, I wanted to make a different world where everybody could have a different power. And I've had a lot of fun with that. Now, and also how do you keep your the humor and always introducing that into your stories? I mean, it was such a big component with the Love at Stake series. And the first one I read, of course, the first one in the series, How to Marry a Vampire. And it's the series I refer to friends of like, this is the grown up Twilight. If you really want to have a really good vampire series, this is it. And that humor is also, yes, I've got that one. <laughs> this is what started it all. That was my first introduction. And I just thought the humor was so apparent in that. And it's something that's echoed in all of the books and even also with the Embrace series. So what do you do to make sure you're in that right mindset when you are writing these books? Or are you I, have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea because really when I started this fantasy series I thought it was going to be serious you know I thought this is the female version of Game of Thrones and it's going to be serious and, and that didn't last you know I, I mean within two pages I'm, I was being silly again I I can't get away from it it's just who I am and then I thought about it and I thought, well, you know, my readers are going to expect it. If, if they get the, you know, I, I did a new series and there was no humor in it at all, they'd go, what in the, what the heck happened to Carolyn Sparks? You know, this is drab. Where, where, you know, where, you know, where's the laughs? And so I'm, I, I think they're, they're expecting it and I don't want to disappoint them. And, and really I can't help but do it anyway. Um, it just happens kind of naturally. I, I I don't really know how to explain it because I think if you try to force it, it's not going to do well. Mm -hmm. And it has to really good humor is humor that happens naturally and that the reader can really want. So the reader won't sit back and go, oh, that was that was contrived or, you know, that if that was set up I saw that coming you know it's got to just happen naturally and um and and happen naturally in a way that the readers will go yeah I can see that happening or if someone says something says some snarky response to something the reader will be going yeah that's what I do that's what I would say that's what I was thinking you know it, it, to make it that relatable that's um I think the the key to the, to doing humor well is is it, it just feels right. It feels natural. Um, most of the humor comes out of the characters, um, and and then the situations you put them in. Well, I know that you've said before that usually the characters come to you first before the plot, and I also know that you're an avid people watcher. So as a two-part question, what is the craziest thing that you've noticed from people watching that has made it into the books? And what have you also seen that you're like, there's no way I could put this in a book because no one would believe it? Huh. I, gosh, I, I think I'm stumped. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything so crazy that I, I wouldn't put it in a book. I mean, there are things that happen in real life that you think if you put it in a book, no one would believe it. I mean, like my, my husband and mine, our own romance, we, uh, I picked him out of a book. Uh, 
It was great expectations. I watched the video and I picked him out of the book. And I thought, oh, he's really cute. And I thought, oh, but his video, he looks kind of young. I better make sure he's not younger than me. So I look up his birthday and it's the same as mine. And then we meet on our birthday, on a blind date, we meet for the first time. And then we find out that his father's name is the same as mine. And then, with, then I'm thinking, I've just met my long lost twin. Oh. And, and then, uh, but it's, he's totally different. And then we try to figure out which one of us is older because we're born in the same, on the same day. And then we realize we're actually born in the same hour. And we were married six months later. We were married several years before we knew which one of us is actually older. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, I even put that in a book. Who would believe it? So, I mean, I guess that, that that would be my example of that's that. I don't know. I mean, I have read the one was a Jude Deborah book where the hero and heroine were born in the castle at the same time. And it was like they were born together and they would they would die together. Is and I always, it was a Jude Devereaux book. But there's been several. There's been several books where where they use that device where mm -hmm. they were born at the same time. Um, but it, it actually happens in real life. <laughs> well, Carolyn, I want to transition into our fresh fiction facts. Now, these are a series of quick questions. Don't have to hopefully think about them too much. But I'm going to start off with an easy one. And kind of going back to our name game, if you had an embraced power, what would it be? Um, I think I would like to teleport because I love to travel and to be able to just go somewhere instantly. So I, I would, I wouldn't want to have to do it like the vampires where they have to make sure there's it's not daylight there because they would burn up. I, uh, you know, I wouldn't have that problem, but. Uh, Gosh, you know, you, you could you could travel around and, and you wouldn't have to be COVID tested all over the country. <laughs> and, and you just, you know, you wouldn't have to go through customs or anything. You just keep zipping around, doing whatever. That works. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think that just would be pass on passport. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be fun. What's your favorite writing fuel? Fuel? Mm-hmm. Like coffee, chocolate, salty, nuts, whatever. I, what keeps I, you going? Nothing. I fast. <laughs> wow, okay. I eat one meal a day. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to avoid and all of the related questions here. <laughs> and, and, and I've done prolonged fast before, you know, like 48-hour fast. So I'm like, well, skip it one meal <laughs> no big deal but no yeah I've gotten into fasting and I, I love it and so I don't I don't need fuel okay <laughs> it's it's all on me it's all on the belt <laughs> I mean, it's built in you know I just keep burning it I unfortunately have I have you know I have I have calories in reserve well, let's go a different direction then. Okay, like I said, getting rid of the food questions then. Who would you want to be stuck with in an elevator? Stuck with in an elevator? Who? My husband? <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, you know, if I ended up embarrassing myself or something, he would be okay. He'd be like, you can't help it. <laughs> It'd be totally understanding, and we we would get through it together and support each other, and uh, it, that would be, and then, you know, he'd be the most comfortable person to be stuck with. What is your most, what luxury item or unnecessary thing can you absolutely not live without? Luxury item I can't live without. Well, I it's, I don't I don't know if you would call it a luxury item, but I mean I can't imagine living without books. But you know, 
if inflation gets worse, it may become a luxury item, unfortunately. Right. Uh, but uh, that's why yeah. we love our libraries, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do book swaps, I guess, yeah. with your friends. But um, but I think most of us would agree with you. I don't know if that would really be a luxury item or if it's an. I hope it's never a luxury it's item. Great. Let's just hope it isn't. But yeah, I can't imagine living without that. Um, who was your favorite talk show host growing up? Talk show host. I don't think I watched any talk shows. <laughs> I'm old. I don't think they had them then. Oh my God. <laughs> talk show. Mm. I didn't watch a lot of TV growing okay. up. So when you I were sick at home, you didn't end up watching not you know the series of donahues and game shows and soap operas no no i mean i remember watching dark shadows when i got home from school some more of the classic but really things. i mean eventually eventually because i was in drama in high school so i was always after school and then by the time i got home and then i usually had dance classes and then i had homework and then I, there was no time for television and even now I haven't turned on a tv in years my husband is you know he's all, he's upstairs watching the Astros you know at this moment but uh no I, I watch most I'm addicted now to Korean television oh I, I watch, the K-drama. yeah I watch k-dramas on uh Netflix and on Vicky mm -hmm. and I love the k-dramas and okay. I've picked up I've picked up some Korean too my daughter wow. and I went to Korea a couple of years ago before the pandemic, mm -hmm. and, and and I did okay. I was able to order food and water and stuff, and, and you know I got along. <laughs> if you suddenly found yourself stranded somewhere, either in time or a location, what three things would you absolutely have to have with you? If I was stranded somewhere. Mm -hmm. ID <laughs> and water oh, and money. <laughs> All very practical items. Definitely. I guess I am. Uh, I mean, but I've traveled enough. I know what you what you kind of need. Exactly. Right. Yeah. What is the clothing or accessory that everyone hates that you own, but you secretly love? Well, I have a thing for scarves. I don't know if some people hate those. Maybe they think they're totally unnecessary, but I have a huge scarf collection. God, I love scarves, especially antique scarves. I buy them on Etsy. I buy antique really? silk scarves. Oh, wow. You know, vintage silk scarves. But mm -hmm. uh, you can get them for only like 15 bucks. You know, and it's not like it's the luxury item, but it, but I, and I wonder who, you know, what, elderly lady had this and where she wore it and <laughs> so, now do you buy like the the large square ones or do you get it where it's more of a shawl or I have different sizes but I, I'm so used to the silk ones that now you know cotton scarves like yeah it's cotton <laughs> or <Where's> my silk <laughs> you know like like I'm so posh but I only pay 15 bucks a piece for <laughs> but um yeah but the, I, I really like them. They're the really pretty ones. What youthful activity do you wish that you could still do? Youthful activity? Well, I always love to dance, uh, but I still, you know, I still do some, but it just, no one would want to see it now. But uh, I... I mean, I was last year, I even took adult dance classes. I went back and took dance classes with the adults. I was the oldest. I was about 20 years older than every all the other adults in there, but I was able to keep up. Well, what kind of dancing? Was it like ballroom dancing? That, was a, that was a ballet class. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm been tempted to go back and take some tap because I was always a really good tap dancer. And, um, but tap, jazz, ballet, you know, the usual things that, Mm -hmm. I was used to take classes in. Oh, very cool. Yeah, but I mean, I, I would point out, you know, I was, um, 
and and toe shoes and stuff Mm -hmm. many many pounds ago well some of that stuff sticks with you i mean i still remember the five positions of ballet yeah never advanced to the toe shoes but i can still do those basics and i can do a shuffle step can't do anything beyond that for tap but (laughs) oh come on if you can do a shuffle step, you can do a shuffle ball change. Come on. And none of that was in heels either. <laughs> <sighs> What's your favorite errand on your day off? Errand on a day off? Or well, do you just never if have, I a, have a day To me, if I have a day off, I don't want to run any errands. Uh, I don't run it. I only run errands if I have to. I, I guess I'm a homebody and an introvert. Unless I'm actually traveling somewhere, I only go out if I have to. But at home, I have so many things to keep me busy other than the writing. I uh, when, when we went into lockdown, I'd always wanted to learn to play the piano, but I'd never had lessons growing up. So I bought a keyboard and I bought a a uh, book that links to YouTube with videos and I taught myself how to read music. And so I practice piano every day. And uh, and then I'm also into uh, crafts. I do a lot of uh, cross stitch, embroidery, crochet. Uh, I have a quilt I'm working on right now and I need it's ready to go into the frame. I hand quilt them in the frames. Um, I, I'm I'm very busy. <laughs> now, have you ever designed cross stitch patterns off of your book covers? Oh gosh, no, no, I never thought about that. See, new I new projects, huh? Because <laughs> I know on your website you've got lots of different games out there for people to also play. Oh yeah, on the website. Yeah, we used to play vampire games and stuff. Yeah. And now on the website, I should mention, because if you're reading the Embrace series, especially this last one, uh, When a Princess Proposes, it's sort of a traveling book. They're on the road most of the time. And if you want to figure out where they are, there is a map on my website, a map of Erithlin, and that might help you figure out exactly where they are, where they're going. Carolyn, what should readers look for from you next? Because you've mentioned already a possible villain in Powers. Uh, Well, that's not, that's even farther in the future, really. Because in the, uh, if you've read When the Princess Proposes, um, it's, you know, it's a 20 year jump ahead. And um, so there's some new villains, but they're sort of left over from, the old villains, some of the old villains, they're the children of the old villains and uh, are the uh, the younger brother and, and some children and uh, that are grown up. But um, they, at the end of this book, some of them are, some are dead, but some are still alive. There's a really bad guy, Father Greer, who can freeze people to death. He's a, he's a, he's a bad villain. And uh, he's so he's in in the, the book I'm writing now. Uh, he's still there, causing trouble, and so he has to be defeated. So we have to defeat the, these this new batch of villains needed to be need to be defeated first before I start off with that super villain idea. Um, people, if they're curious, you know who's the next because each book has a different hero and heroine. And a lot of people are rooting for the Raven who makes an appearance in this book. And he's sort of, is he good? Is he bad kind of a guy? Uh, I mean, he's been raised to be bad, but you can tell he's not really bad. And it's a really questionable character. And people have gotten really interested in the Raven. And he is going to be back and he will be the hero in the next book. And a lot of people who they want him to be paired with, I mean, because I hinted at it, you know, I hinted at it in this book. But it will be Lanushka, the first female dragon shifter of the um, 
cool. in this world. So she is the heroine. And we do have a title, which no one knows if, if you want to be the first. Of exclusive. course, we always want to have the, the newest news. Yes, y'all, this is an exclusive for Fresh Fiction. The new title is When a Dragon Falls. Because okay, it's like so when a princess proposes, this is when a dragon falls. And referring to Lanushka, the first female dragon shifter and who she falls for. And awesome. um, yes. So where else can readers follow you and keep in touch and see what's next and possibly other exclusives? Well, um, there's my website, www.carolynsparks.com. Um, then I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and, um, on Facebook, cause I have like a friend page, but then I have the author type page. Uh, that's where I do a contest every month. So if you're interested in the books, if you want to give them a try or whatever, you can always, um, uh, try my contest because every month I'm giving away free books. And so, uh, you know come and join the contest every month and sooner or later you, you know you could win and 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 get a freebie and and they're signed of course you know I'm, I sign them here and mail them out but uh and and I'm also on Goodreads yeah I'm on Goodreads too if you post a question there I get a notice in my email that someone's asked a question and then so I can go over there and answer it um and I'm on BookBub so Okay. That's about that's about all I do. I mean, that's plenty. As far as I'm <laughs> concerned, that's enough. Well, Carolyn, it was so great chatting with you today, and good to see you again. And hopefully, uh, we can have some more questions in our reader Q and A. And people will be on the lookout for when a dragon falls for the next book, but also read the latest release when a princess proposes. So, thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you.